Hello, and thank you for joining us today for the first part in our two-part series on filtering for dynamic signals. For those of you not familiar with precision filters, we've been in business since 1975 and offer a complete range of instrumentation for analog signal conditioning and switch system products. We also have a line of modules compatible for use in National Instruments, CDAC, and CREO platforms. I am joined today by Doug Firth, who will be your host for the next 40 minutes. Doug is the President and Sales Manager at Precision Filters. He has over 25 years experience designing and developing instrumentation for products sold in the aerospace, transportation, and energy and defense markets around the world. He has several published works on analog filter design and theory, and today we'll be exploring filter technologies and characteristics of dynamic measurements. Thanks, Bridget. Uh, of note, if you have any questions uh, that come up uh, during the presentation, there's a chat function in WebEx, and if you would just chat your question to us, we'll get to the questions at the end of the presentation. We'll answer as many as we, we can. So the first thing we'd like to start out with uh, in the presentation is to answer the question, what in fact is a filter? And a filter is any frequency selective circuit that, that passes some components of the, the input signal and rejects others. Um, the filter is often used to improve the, the signal quality by boosting the signal uh, energy and rejecting uh, the unwanted part or what we call the noise in the signal. The filter is also used to protect against a, a phenomenon called aliasing where uh, two signals can have identical uh, samples, but one signal we're interested in and, and the other signal is a, an, an alias of, of the signal we're interested in. Um, the components of a filter are shown in the, the chart here. In the green portion, that's called the passband of the filter. That's where we want uh, the signal of interest to lie. Uh, the red portion is the transition region of the filter. That's where we're, we're moving um, in the amplitude response from the pass band uh, to the stop band. And the stop band is uh, where we want the, the energy that, that we are, are not interested in to lie. Uh, the stop band will attenuate um, that unwanted noise or energy with a minimum uh, level of attenuation. An active filter, which is what we uh, use exclusively here at Precision Filters, is built with powered components, components that require um, voltage supplies, power supplies to, to uh, power them. And uh, these, these components are op amps, uh, transistors, and electromechanical switches or semiconductor switches. And then we um, use precision resistors and capacitors uh, to form topologies that make uh, the different filter characteristics that we're interested in. The picture we have here on this slide is called a, a state variable filter in that it presents uh, high pass, band pass, and low pass outputs for uh, a ratio of second order polynomials um, uh, where we can implement uh, poles and zeros of uh, of pretty much any transfer function we want. Active filters come with a number of advantages. You can realize accuracies of 0.01 percent or better. You can implement very sharp high-order filters uh, with active components. You can make the device fully programmable not only in frequency but in, in filter characteristic. You can add an amplifier to the filter to have signal gain or attenuation, and you can build the filter block, filter amplifier block, with very high input impedance and very low output impedance, so that when you insert it in the signal chain, you get uh, little or no insertion loss. The filters are extremely stable in an active configuration, stable not only uh, with DC stability, but AC stability as well. And, and the filter has extremely uh, low self-generated noise. Disadvantage of active filters is they, they require power. Uh, you need uh, constant voltage power supplies to power the active components in the design. 
they're generally more costly to build and can be physically uh, larger than, say, uh, uh, a simple passive filter. But for uh, high precision measurement class, uh, where you're trying to make very precise AC and DC measurements, active filters are really your only choice uh, for programmable instruments. Just to give you an idea of what products would look like that contain active filters, um, we have a multi-channel instrument on the left. That's a rack mountable 19 inch wide by 10 and a half inch uh, high by about 22 inch deep box that holds modules that can have up to eight filters per module, 16 modules in the box. So 128 eight channels of fully programmable high performance filter amplifiers. Uh, in the center we have the compact Rio system or compact uh, DAC system. That's a platform developed by National Instruments and PFI makes filter modules, active filter modules uh, and other signal conditioning modules uh, for that platform. This is a on the on the right here we have the a PFA2 this is a two channel uh, lab filter um, very high performance two channel DC powered filter uh, where you only need a couple channels and that that is a about a half rack uh, in width and uh, about uh, eight inches in depth and then below you have the PF1U uh, that's a 16 channel filter also rack mountable 1U uh, 1 and 3 quarter inches high. So this gives you an idea of what uh, different implementations of a programmable active filter system uh, would take on. There are four basic classes of filters. The high pass filter which rejects low frequency and passes high frequencies. Uh, there's a low pass filter which passes low frequencies and rejects high frequencies. Uh, the notch filter or band reject filter which rejects a, a band of frequencies. And then the, the band pass filter which passes a band of frequencies. Our discussion today will, will primarily focus on the low pass filter. I'd like to introduce a couple basic terms. Frequency is a repetition rate of a periodic uh, signal or sinusoidal signal and it's uh, represented in cycles per second or in units of Hertz. Uh, period is the the time for a sine wave or periodic signal uh, periodic waveform to repeat itself and the relationship between frequency and period is uh, uh, an inverse one where frequency equals 1 over the period. The term gain which I've already used in this presentation is uh, expressed in decibels and that's to sensibly plot uh, very wide ranges of gain in a, on a compressed scale. Gain, um, voltage gain in decibels is 20 times the log to the base 10 of the output voltage divided by the input voltage in the filter and these are these voltages are represented uh, in terms of the magnitude of the input and output uh, sinusoid that we place through the filter at a given frequency. So just to to do some uh, review here uh, if we have a gain of um, 1 over 10,000 or an attenuation of 10,000 that, that gain in um, decibels is minus 80 dB. Um, a gain of 1 is 0 dB, a gain of 10 is 20 dB and you can see as we increase gain by a factor of 10 we increase decibels by by 20 or we add 20 to the decibel. Um, a special gain is uh, the minus 3.01 dB uh, gain. That's usually designated as the cutoff frequency of the filter uh, where the, the filter is about 30 percent down and that comes from um, power uh, in that the uh, 3 dB frequency is the, the the frequency where you have uh, half, half of the power in the signal. Factor 
phase is the angular difference between uh, two sinusoids that are, are at the same frequency and measured between uh, a, a reference point. It's usually expressed in degrees or radians. Phase delay, on the other hand, is the time difference between uh, two sinusoids at the same frequency and measured at the same reference point on their waveforms. So phase is in degrees, phase delay is in seconds. So here's an example of, of two 1 hertz uh, sinusoids that are phase shifted with respect to one another. So, and they're, and they're in fact phase shifted by 45 degrees of phase. And we can easily convert between phase and, and phase delay um, by, by, by recognizing that there's 360 degrees of phase shift in one period of, of a sinusoid. In this case, our period for, for one hertz sinusoid is one second. So 45 degrees is easily equated to 0.125 seconds. 45 degrees divided by 360 times one second, the period of a one hertz sinusoid is an eighth of a second. That's called the phase delay. An equation that we call the filter equation, or I'll often just refer to it as the transfer function, is a ratio of two polynomials, a numerator polynomial and a denominator polynomial. The variable of s is an independent variable uh, that's related to frequency. The denominator polynomial can be expanded into coefficients uh, that, that uh, are multiplying powers of s. Um, the poles are the roots of, uh, of the denominator polynomial. If we set it equal to zero and solve for values of s that um, that make that thing zero, those are the the uh, poles of the the filter, and we'll call a an eighth order filter or a fourth order filter. The the fourth or the eighth is the indication of how many poles there are in the filter. As we increase the number of poles in a filter, the complexity of the filter increases and the cost to implement that filter, the amount of hardware we need, uh, increases. A fourth order Butterworth filter takes twice as much hardware as, or half as much hardware as an eighth order Butterworth filter. Uh, likewise, uh, the numerator polynomial um, in our transfer function or filter equation has similar form uh, to the denominator and the roots of this polynomial are called the zeros of the filter. The frequency response of the filter is um, the plot of the filter in both the amplitude um, and phase domains of the, the filter. We can pl plot the amplitude versus frequency of the filter and we call that the amplitude response we can plot the phase versus frequency of the filter and we'll call that the filter's phase response. And here's a simple example of a really basic um, single pole filter formed by a resistor and a capacitor. This has 6 dB per octave roll-off and in the green uh, that is the amplitude response the filter starts out at 0 dB or gain of 1 at low frequency. It's um, 3 dB down in this case um, at 1 hertz. That's the cutoff frequency of the filter and then rolls off um, with a constant slope in dB per, per decade or dB per octave. The phase response on the other hand is showing 
uh, phase shift um, in degrees input to output versus frequency and you can see um, at low frequency we have very little phase shift at uh, cutoff frequency we've got about 45 degrees of phase shift and ultimately at the high frequency this um, filter has 90 degrees of phase shift which is uh, what you get through a, uh, a capacitive element So we talked about amplitude response and phase response, and there's a third response uh, that we're concerned with with respect to filters, especially uh, when measuring dynamic signals and making dynamic measurements, and, and uh, a category of dynamic measurements that we call shock measurements that deal, are dealing with impulsive signals. This response is called the transient response. The transient response of the filter is gotten by uh, taking uh, the inverse Fourier transfer form of the transfer function equation. Uh, that's known as the impulse response in the time domain. And you can do an approximation of the impulse response if you have a signal generator that can uh, generate very narrow pulses um, to the filter um, and measure the output of the filter uh, uh, with respect to this very narrow impulse and that that does a pretty good job of approximating the impulse response if you take the integral of the impulse response uh, we come up with something we call the step response and the step response is um, very commonly used to compare um, the transient behavior of different filters it's easy, easily measured in the lab. We can take a, a, a signal generator, uh, set it to square wave mode, set the period to be very, very long um, with respect to the cutoff frequency of the filter. And when the signal generator uh, output goes high, that is akin to a sudden DC input applied to the filter. And we can look at the output of the filter in response to this sudden DC input and we call that the, the step response. And the step response we'll talk about in part two of, of our presentation um, but it has a lot of attributes that we, that we uh, recognize such as the overshoot and ringing that we see in this plot. Uh, you can see it, it uh, has an oscillatory response that decays in time uh, in an exponential envelope. Uh, we're interested in how long that response decays to uh, a certain percentage of the, the steady state value. Uh, we're interested in the delay time um, from the time we apply the, the sudden DC input to the time that we have a, a response on the output and other attributes. So we'll take a closer look at this in part two of this, of this series. Other terms we've already alluded to, the cutoff frequency, or we'll we'll uh, designate it that is F sub C and that's the frequency that defines the end of the passband usually the the minus 3 dB frequency but it can be arbitrarily defined by the the uh, manufacturer of the unit this is the frequency that is displayed on the front panel or the the graphical user interface software for the instrument the stop band uh, attenuation, that's the, the minimum attenuation level that the filter provides at a designated frequency. Um, th that designated frequency is called the stop band frequency and that's the frequency for which uh, the beginning of the stop band is reached and where we uh, also reach the minimum attenuation uh, level provided by the stop band. octave and decade, uh, that's uh, octave is a doubling or halving in the frequency. So 6 dB per octave rep represents a 2x increase or decrease in gain with a 2x increase or decrease in frequency. And a decade is a 10 to 1 ratio in frequency. The roll-off um, is the average slope 
of a line from the cutoff frequency to the stop band frequency, and that's usually expressed in dB per oct octave or dB per decade. And then something called the shape factor, which I, I actually prefer to use over roll-off, is a, um, a representation of the selectivity or the sharpness of the filter. And that's the ratio of the stop band frequency to the cutoff frequency. So if we have that ratio approaching one, you have a, a filter that is a brick wall filter, very, very selective. And we can have filters that have shape factors of, of in excess of 20. They're not very selective. Um, not not very doing a very good job of uh, of eliminating that outband energy. So an ideal low pass filter would look like this, where we have uh, gain in the pass band of the filter um, that's tightly controlled. Um, at when we reach the cutoff frequency, we have infinite slope um, attenuation slope to the stop band. And then the stop band will have will, will not let anything uh, pass through. The practical filter, practical low pass filter, introduces a transition region, and that's a region uh, between the pass band and the stop band where the filter uh, progresses in um, increasing uh, attenuation um, or decreasing gain to the stop band of the filter and all practical filters require a transition region to, in order to uh, mathematically realize the filter. Um, the filter also may have, uh, may not be perfectly flat in the pass band, it may have some ripple, what we call ripple. And in the stop band it'll have finite uh, stop band attenuation. It doesn't completely and totally reject signals, but it does so with a finite amount of uh, of gain. Some filter types we'll be discussing for this presentation. Uh, the Butterworth filter, which is a familiar filter characteristic. The elliptic um, and flat mode elliptic filters. The Bessel, which is another uh, familiar characteristic and the modified Bessel or pulse mode filter which is uh, a term coined by precision filters to describe the modified Bessel that we've uh, developed. These two plots are plots of uh, Butterworth filters and on the same plot we have a four pole, six pole, and eight pole Butterworth filter. Recall the number of poles is the order of the denominator of the transfer function of the filter and the number of poles also uh, ties directly into the complexity of the hardware uh, needed to impl implement the filter. A four pole Butterworth requires about half as much hardware as a, an eight pole, a sharper eight pole Butterworth filter. So these have what what is called a maximally flat pass band this is the ma mathematical representation of the filter has a mathematically or maximally flat pass band and a monotonic roll off equal uh, to um, 6 times n dB per octave where n is a number of poles. Um, that's the asymptote that the um, slope of the filter approaches. So an eight, eighth order um, Butterworth filter has 48 dB per octave of attenuation slope. The lower graph in this chart um, represents a zoomed in picture of the pass band of the filter and as you see you see as we add more poles to the filter uh, it does a better approximation of a uh, maximally flat pass band. The 8 pole Butterworth um, is flatter uh, for a longer duration of the pass band than the four pole, as you can see, all of them converge at at uh, unity normalized frequency in this plot. That's the cutoff frequency, and they all pass through minus three uh, dB at the uh, cutoff frequency. So elliptic filters or elliptical filters have equiripple amplitude response in the pass band. 
in echo ripple uh, response in the stop band as well. Uh, as a designer, you can specify the precise amount of passband ripple you want and uh, the amount of stop band attenu attenuation you want, and then a unique uh, filter characteristic given the number of poles that you're going to use to implement it is defined um, by the passband ripple and stop band ripple. So you have an infinite number of possibilities uh, for elliptic filters. And the uniqueness of an elliptic filter is that it has the sharpest uh, transition from passband to stop band of any filter. So here at uh, Precision Filters we offer proprietary uh, filter characteristics that we refer to as a flat mode elliptic filter. And this uh, mode of elliptic filter has uh, um, maximally flat passband, zero passband uh, ripple, like a, a Butterworth filter, except even better than a Butterworth filter. Yet uh, the roll-off of the maximally flat elliptic is, is much sharper and much more selective than the Butterworth filter. And you've got two charts here to, to observe. Uh, the top chart, uh, you can see the eighth order PF uh, flat mode filter is indicated and compared to an eight pole uh, Butterworth filter. And you can see the, the slope of the LP8F is it's much sharper and more selective than the, the Butterworth filter. In fact, it's down 80 dB at 1.7 times the program cutoff frequency. That would be what we called the shape factor of the filter. The 8-pole Butterworth filter is down 80 dB at 3.16 times the cutoff frequency. So quite a difference in attenuation slope. And similarly, for the 4-pole counterparts, we can see the, the LP4F flat mode filter is, is more selective than the Butterworth. As we zoom into the passband in the second graph, um, you see the eighth order um, elliptic filter, the LP8F, is flatter for a longer uh, uh, or greater percentage of the, the passband than the corresponding eight pole Butterworth. And similarly, um, the four pole flat mode filter and the, and the four pole Butterworth, um, they have nearly identical uh, characteristics. So when we talked about the notion of the ideal filter, we were mainly concerned with the amplitude response in that the pass pan wanted to be as flat as possible and the transition from pass pan to stop pan as sharp as possible. But there is another important criteria and we've already touched on the phase response and that is that the filter exhibit uh, phase that varies linearly with respect to frequency. Why do we want linear phase? Well, a filter that has a linear phase property imparts equal delay to all frequencies present in the passband or across the passband. So that is, uh, if you have a, a waveform that is spectrally rich, has lots of uh, frequency content in the passband, and you're interested in preserving its time domain wave shape, it's extremely important that all those frequency components that comprise a waveform are delayed by the same amount of time as they pass through the filter. A filter or transfer function that has nonlinear phase will impart different delays uh, to frequencies across the passband of the filter. Um, if you have, again, uh, an input signal that's spectrally rich, has lots of frequency content, um, you will see different delays uh, to those frequencies that comprise a signal across the passband. Those different delays will uh, produce what we call waveform distortion. A measurement of how good um, a filter's uh, linear phase property is, is uh, called group delay. And group delay is defined as a negative derivative of the phase with respect to frequency. So if a filter has linear phase, then it stands to reason that the derivative of a filter with linear phase is a constant. Hence, uh, we refer to uh, filters with constant group delay. That's uh, equivalent to saying that the filter has linear phase. The Bessel filter 
which you may have studied, is a, a well-known filter uh, in the family of all pole filters in that it is designed to maximize or optimize the phase linearity for a given order or given number of poles. Um, the vessel has almost perfect phase linearity in the passband and in exchange for that the amplitude response is quite broadly rounded when compared to a Butterworth or a uh, maximally flat elliptic filter which we we looked at a few slides earlier. Precision Filters um, has developed a transfer function that we call uh, the pulse mode or pulse mode linear phase filters. The pulse mode filters have amplitude response similar uh, to their Bessel counterparts um, and the passband in fact is, is nearly identical. But in studying the, the top chart on the left you can see that the transition rate of the LP8P pulse mode filter is much more abrupt than its 8-pole Bessel counterpart. Uh, the pulse mode filter is down 80 dB at about 3.5 times the program cutoff frequency, while the 8-pole Bessel is down uh, 80 dB at 6 times, so much uh, more selective, uh, abrupt uh, transition region. So back to the notion of group delay. If we look at the group delay for the LP8F flat mode filter and the LP8P pulse mode filter, uh, precision filters uh, characteristics, we can see uh, at, with the red arrow that the group delay of the LP8F is not constant as we go through the passband. The passband here is defined from 0 to 1 in normalized frequency. So the fact that the group delay is not constant implies that this filter does not have linear phase and it will not impart the same delay uh, to all frequencies in the passband of the filter, i.e. it's a poor choice uh, when we're analyzing waveforms in the time domain and wave shape reproduction is important. Looking at the green arrow, that's pointing to the group delay of the pulse mode filter and we can see in the passband from 0 to 1 that the, the group delay is, is a constant. This filter has linear phase. It will impart the same time delay input to output to all frequencies in the passband of the filter and it will preserve wave shapes in the time domain. A term uh, we refer, refer to as phase distortion is the deviation of the actual phase versus frequency curve uh, when compared to an ideal characteristic of linear phase. And here we have two plots. Uh, the one on the left is the phase distortion of the elliptic um, flat mode filter. Um, its phase response, again, is, is nonlinear across the passband. And we can see uh, the phase distortion curve grows from, from minimal phase distortion up to about half the cutoff frequency. Maybe we have five degrees at half the cutoff frequency. And then it starts to get significant uh, where at the cutoff frequency at one um, we've got uh, about a hundred degrees of, of phase distortion. On the right uh, we're looking at the pulse mode LP8P and it has linear phase and the phase distortion curve is uh, less than 0.05 degrees across the passband. So, so excellent phase linearity for the pulse mode characteristic. We can do a couple experiments uh, to, to demonstrate why linear phase is important. And what we're going to do is, is take a, a pulse mode filter with a cutoff set at 3 hertz and we're going to put in a, a hypothetical waveform that's comprised of the first two harmonics of a square wave the fundamental and third harmonic. And it will look at the output on an oscilloscope. If we do that, we see that the input and output are shifted in time with respect to each other. The time shift is equal to the phase delay of, of the filter. Um, but you, we can see also that the wave shapes of these two uh, input, the input and the output have been maintained thanks to the constant group delay property of the pulse mode filter. 
Now we'll do the same experiment using an 8-pole elliptic filter set at 3 hertz. This has a very, very flat passband, but nonlinear phase. And the result of this experiment shows that the, the output doesn't look very much like the input. And the reason is, is that the fundamental and third harmonics of our hypothetical waveform received different input to output uh, time delays as they passed through the filter. And superposition of those two waveforms at the output shows uh, some a waveform that that is uh, distorted that does not look like what we put in. So given that we have a measurement system and we want to um, faithfully reproduce uh, a wave shape in the time domain, what criteria should we use in, in setting up the transfer function of our measurement system? Well there's two criteria that we've talked about. Uh, one would be that the amplitude response of the filter uh, be flat enough so as not to impart um, attenuation uh, to the frequency content of the waveform we're trying to measure. And the second criteria would be uh, that the frequency content of the waveform we're trying to measure lie in the linear phase region of, of the transfer function of our measurement system so as not to cause waveform distortion. So Pat Walter and, and Chuck Wright, they're two uh, uh, test and measurement gurus, and they lecture uh, throughout the country and, and throughout the world. Um, and they've, they've proposed a criteria of 5% amplitude flatness and five degrees phase linearity be um, generally sufficient um, for wave shape to be uh, properly preserved. So we'll stick with that criteria as a, a means to set up our transfer function. So let's start with an example. Suppose we have a measurement system that has a two-pole AC coupled input at 10 Hertz, meaning it's going to block uh, frequency content in our, in our input waveform um, at 10 Hertz and below. And then we've got a, an 8-pole flat mode LP8F precision filter, low pass filter, and its cutoff is set to 25 kilohertz. We're trying to measure shock and we want a flat bandwidth uh, to within 5% from 100 hertz to 10 kilohertz um, and we want phase linearity to within 5 degrees from 100 hertz to 10 kilohertz. The question is will the system meet this requirement? So we uh, plot the amplitude response of our system and we look at the uh, 0.5 or 0.5 dB or 5% uh, flatness region and we find that the the two pole AC coupled high pass network is 5% down at 18 Hertz and the LP8F um, low pass filter is 5% down at 22.5 kilohertz so from 100 Hertz to 10 K we're great uh, we're well within the the 5% um, criteria that we were looking for. Let's look at the phase response. This is uh, the phase response of the, the measurement system and to determine uh, the phase linearity we want to look at the uh, phase distortion curve. So this phase distortion curve is plotted with respect to the zero frequency uh, phase slope of the 8-pole low-pass filter. So we've plotted the, the phase distortion and we see that um, at 100 Hertz we've got more than, than 5 degrees, our criteria. So right away uh, we know that this system is not going to work. In fact, um, its 5 degree uh, linearity span is 160 Hertz to 11.5 K. So we make it on the, on the upper end, 10 K being our, our requirement, but at the lower end uh, we're not making it. 
So the answer is no, we can't do it with this system. And, and what could we do? Well, to reduce the phase nonlinearity at the low end, we can reduce the frequency of the tuple high-pass filter if our system's programmable, or we can reduce the order of the high-pass filter from two poles to one pole, which will reduce the amount of phase shift we have down there. So we can take um, measure against this if we have a programmable system and PFI uh, cells, uh, programmable systems for this reason. Um, if it's not programmable, uh, then then you're not going to be able to, to meet the criteria. You're going to have to, to relax uh, the criteria. So to summarize, we talked about the uh, uses and properties of filters and how active filters uh, are your best choice for precision measurement systems in that they uh, can be built to high accuracy, have very low noise, they're extremely stable, uh, they're straightforward to make programmable, um, and they're just simply the, the best and most versatile choice. We talked about uh, transfer functions and the amplitude response, phase response, and transient response, which we touched on and we'll talk more about in our next uh, um, presentation, part two of this, uh, this series. We talked about some filter types, Butterworth Bessel, um, elliptic, precision flat elliptic, and, and pulse mode uh, precision filters. We touched on the importance of, of linear phase and constant group delay uh, and how it's um, critical for wave shape reproduction. And we summarized or concluded with a example in setting the filter transfer function. Uh, for wave shape reproduction criterion and the criteria we used were uh, a 5% amplitude flatness and 5 degree uh, phase linearity uh, requirement. In a couple weeks uh, in Bridget will send out the um, announcement we'll have part two of this series uh, filtering for dynamic signals and in that part we'll talk about more about transient response of filters so that'll be the step response and the impulse response um, we'll talk about bandpass filters and their properties the distributed gain uh, filter amplifier and how you can use um, a topology like that to pre prevent signal clipping on on large outband signals such as transducer resonance we'll talk about um, filter specifications. What are important specs when you're in the market for a filter? And then noise. Um, there's a, uh, When we talk about filter amplifiers we're always talking about RTI referred to the input and RTO referred to the output noise. How uh, broadband noise and spectral noise are related and how to basically set your measurement system up to optimize uh, signal to noise. And, of course, uh, no discussion on filters would be complete without talking about uh, aliasing and anti-aliasing uh, filters. So I hope you can join us uh, next time, and I appreciate uh, you, you uh, taking time out of your day to, to listen to this present presentation. I hope you found it useful. So now we'll take a, a couple questions uh, from, from you folks. Uh, Bridget, do you have the questions? Yes, we did get a couple questions come in throughout the presentation, and I've added them. Uh, the first question is, where do we get the transfer function data to check the 5% 5 degree criteria? Well, that's a, a good question. And at Precision Filters, um, we publish the transfer function data in the form of a, a spec sheet. And what I've put in front of you there is the the flat and pulse mode spec sheet for the 8-pole filter, the LP8F and LP8P. And in this spec sheet you can see we tabulate some of the key specifications that you'd be interested in, such as um, the DC gain, uh, the stop band frequency, uh, and, and we tabulate uh, different frequencies on the amplitude response. And then we include a whole bunch of, of graphs, uh, many of which we should be familiar now, uh, having gone through the presentation. Uh, we, we 
tabulate the amplitude and phase response, the phase distortion, um, and we give you charts uh, showing uh, the, the phase and amplitude response. So from these charts, you can uh, um, use them to, to figure out uh, for a given measurement system setup uh, where your 5% and 5 degree points will be for your measurement system. If you, of course, if you have any um, questions about this, uh, you can feel free to, to call us here at Precision Filters and one of our application engineers can, can assist you with the, with the computation. The next question is, how does group delay relate to phase delay? Well, that's a, a pretty subtle question, but a really good question. Um, so we remember the group delay was the negative derivative of the phase response with respect to frequency. And the phase delay was uh, defined as something much different. We were computing the fractional uh, delay of two waveforms um, on the same reference point and we were looking, we were converting uh, uh, degrees or radians to time. So we're actually computing the exact uh, time delay you'd see for a waveform um, that, that saw that uh, phase difference. Group delay is a more abstract uh, thing. If, the, if group delay is in fact constant, so that says that implies you have linear phase, then the phase delay and group delay uh, numbers converge. However, if group delay is not constant, such as uh, what we would see on an elliptic filter, um, the group delay doesn't really have much physical meaning other, other than to say that you don't have constant uh, uh, time delay. So I, I think the phase delay uh, is an item that that has a lot more physical meaning um, that you can actually use to, to determine the actual input to output delay of, uh, of, of a given transfer function at a certain frequency. The group delay merely relates to you that, that uh, you either have or, or don't have um, linear phase. The next question that came in, you mentioned that the filters you manufacture are programmable. What aspects of filters are programmable? Well, uh, for the products that, that we manufacture, the, the main aspect of the filter that's programmable is the cutoff frequency. Um, a typical product would ha will have the cutoff frequency programmable from as low as uh, a tenth of a hertz, and we have products that go up to uh, above three megahertz. And we'll provide a couple thousand different settings uh, in between the range uh, for, the, for the user to program. So you can tailor the, the bandwidth to the exact um, uh, frequency response that you want. Um, another aspect of, of our products uh, that is programmable with, with respect to the filter is the characteristic itself. So our products allow you to program uh, the filter for the flat mode characteristic, which would be uh, a characteristic that's ideal for uh, frequency domain measurements, like if you're doing uh, fast Fourier transforms, um, spectral analysis on stationary type signals, that's a, an excellent characteristic to use. However, if you're, you're doing shock or time domain analysis, you want a characteristic that has a good transient response in linear phase, and you can program uh, our products to give you that pulse mode characteristic. So the cutoff frequency and the filter characteristic is programmable. The last question we're going to take today is, what about digital filtering? Why do you need a sharp analog filter if the back end ADC system contains a digital filter? Well, as uh, you, you folks know, um, many of the analog to digital converter systems that are available today have sigma delta converters in them that um, provide a, a digital filtering um, function. Um, the converter oversamples the input, um, digitally filters it, and then decimates or throws out uh, redundant or unneeded samples that represent the, the waveform you're measuring. Uh, for a sigma delta converter, you need a, a minimal uh, front end filter for anti-aliasing purposes. But if your signal has a an unfavorable noise-to-signal 
ratio coming in. That is, the, the outband noise is much larger than the in-band signal you're trying to measure. That's going to hugely limit um, the dynamic range of the recording if you don't have a front end, a good front end filter to separate the, the wanted signal from the unwanted outband noise. A good example of, of such a situation would be a resonant uh, sensor uh, where you can have outband resonant gain of several hundred and you're trying to measure a, a signal in band and it's getting swamped by that outband resonance. You need a filter to improve your signal to noise to knock down that unwanted outband energy and to, to uh, preserve the in band energy and preferably you, you want a, an amplifier after that filter to, to amplify that in-band in energy to the desired full-scale input of the A to D uh, before that A to D records that signal. So um, for traditional uh, converter systems or, or for converter systems that don't have um, back-end DSP to do a, a digital filter, uh, this would be like a SAR converter successive approximation register converter, um, the quality of your front-end filter is going to determine the sample rate that you need to run at for a given attenuation of aliases. And the sharper the filter that you buy, uh, the, the lower data volume uh, you're going to have in your recording. So that's just a few reasons uh, why you'd want to invest in a good front-end uh, programmable um, active filter. Thanks again for joining us today. Please stay tuned for information on the second part in this two-part series. I'll be sending information out on that in the next few weeks.